Oh, that's what it is. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again this month for Learn with Google, September 2023. And I'm joined with my colleague Steve over in Auckland. Good up, way over here. Uh, and uh, this month we're going to be looking at the idea of saving time and empowering students with self-marking quizzes. We're going to keep it pretty brief today. We'll get through this, the quiz part of it, and then we have a couple of uh, uh, a couple of important updates we want to let you know about in our usual session. But uh, let's kick it off. So just before we do, uh, of course, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we're meeting today, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land and honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land over here in Australia. And we hop across the other side of the Tasman and to you, Steve. Look at that. Uh, and uh, Maunga Whaka here and away to Kukuri. He te tūpuna tenakwe tenakoto tato. I must say, Chris, I love those new images. They're fantastic. Nice, nice, aren't they? I like that one in New Zealand. With the, um... Weird. It makes the earth look like it's round, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So we shall carry on. And as usual, uh, just introduce you to the team. Uh, Steve and I are here today, but there is a whole team behind us. And you can see their pictures up on the screen there and all the things we do. All right, uh, today we're going to talk about creating and using self-marking quizzes. We'll use, do our usual what's new with Google for Education, and if we have any questions at the end, we can do that, although I think question time will be pretty short today. So um, let's kick it off. So self-marking quizzes. Um, do you use quizzes much, Steve? They're really nice for like a, a little chicken or a... I mean, I've seen them re used really well for um, like a do now when you first come into class, open your Chromebook, go into classroom, do you quiz questions kind of set the scene or that that end of the end of the unit check in yeah and i thought like we're talking about self-marking quizzes today but as i started to prepare this i realized there's all this other stuff you can do with forms that i think is worth mentioning as well so i thought mm -hmm. we'd just introduce a couple of things about forms in general and then maybe talk about the self-marking side of things in, nice. in, in detail um if you are new to forms and you've never used it before, and I, I don't know how many people that would be because it's one of those super useful things, everyone tries it. But if you are new to forms, uh, we do have a really useful resource on the Google for Education website. Um, I've put a short link there for you, not that it's that short. Um, I'll put a short <laughs> link there for you in case you want to jump directly to it. It's just bit.ly slash getting started with forms or lowercase. Uh, that'll take you there. There's a bunch of short videos and some initial sort of training stuff that you can do to get your head around using forms. Um, it's the, and there's a ton of great stuff. If you haven't looked at the Google for Education website, and in particular, the for educators section, mm. we used to call it the teacher center, but now it's just called for educators. Weird. Um, anyway, so there's a whole bunch of resources there if you're looking for good resources. Uh, so some of the things you can do with Google Forms uh, obviously, you can use it to collect and manage data. Uh, and the key word there is easily. And I think a lot of times people are a little bit blown away with how easily you can do this. It literally takes, you know, a couple of minutes to knock up a form if it's a simple mm. one. Um, but the great thing about it is it collects that data all in one place and then exports it out to a spreadsheet and you get everything in one place. And the, the silly example I always use, Steve, is like, you know, like I've worked in schools where you know, you, the staff is doing a morning tea and, and someone sends out a message and says, oh, everyone needs to bring like a cake or some biscuits or whatever. And like, can you email me back and let me know what you'll be bringing? And that poor person who's managing all the emails. Mm. Um, I, I often so, find that we, when you do some work with the with the admin staff of a school and you show them forms, like, oh my goodness, I don't have to send it. Yeah. One I, I always use is, you know, report night, who wants what for dinner? We yep. used to like our, our our management used to buy um like there's a Chinese takeaways down the road and they kind of do all the all the Chinese takeaways for everyone and everyone would like email them back I'd like this and this and this and this yeah show them forms like oh my goodness you just saved me a whole day of work yeah yeah so just that just that first line there about collecting and managing data like that's a killer application and because it goes into a spreadsheet if you've got a little bit of spreadsheet skills you can actually do some really interesting things with the data once you collect it. Um, but anyway, so uh, surveys, questionnaires, uh, any anytime you want to poll parents or, you know, we used to, at my school, we used to do voting for the school captain. Um, we used to do that. We, we, we had like, like you say, picking, uh, uh, picking what you're going to bring to, you know, staff lunches and that kind of thing. Mm. So there's that. Um, conditional branching surveys, one of the things you can do inside forms is you can uh, have a question which, depending on how you answer it, it goes to a different part of the form. And I've got an example I can show you as we go through. So branching. And one of the really interesting things, uh, so our 
I was talking to school recently and they were using forms. I like what we want people to hand in stuff. And like, how do we get someone to put stuff into a folder, but not be able to see what's in that folder? Right. I was like, well, you could do a form. And one of the questions can be a file upload. Yeah. And so they get some stuff and they'd upload it to the file. And then they wouldn't be able to go into the folder and have a good dig around. So it was, again, another really interesting use of forms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and I, I, I've seen a lot of examples where you ask kids to produce something that like it's a digital asset. So they maybe, I don't know, they maybe produce a YouTube video or they, you know, make a podcast or something, anything with a URL. And then collecting that from students, one of the ways they can hand that in is through a Google form. And they just paste the URL into a field there. And now you've got a, a, like a spreadsheet with a link to everybody's work. That's another way you can use it. Mm -hmm. um, with that branching business, so you can branch. And like a classic example is you might have a survey for students and, you know, you ask what year group they're in. And depending on what year group they say, they get a different set of questions. So year seven gets a different set of questions to year 10, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but that same idea of being able to branch to things, you can do things like a choose your own adventure game. Um, I've seen uh, kids design sort of, you know, those choose your own adventure sort of stories and do it in Google Forms. Um, I'm going to show you an example I made uh, in what's called a dichotomous key. Um, biology teachers would understand what that's all about, um, which is the same kind of thing. It's a branching thing, but kind of in reverse. So I can show you that in a minute. Um, locked mode quizzes. This is one for schools that use uh, managed Chromebooks. So if you've got mm -hmm. Chromebooks in your school, and you uh, and they're under management. In other words, they have licenses and they're in your domain being managed. Um, one of the things you can do is locked mode quizzes. So there's this little switch that you switch across when you create the quiz and when the student goes to do that quiz, so long as they're on a managed Chromebook, it will actually lock that quiz onto the screen and shut everything else out. So mm. for those of us in Australia would be familiar with NAPLAN where you kind of you're doing those you know exam style um, assessments and you don't want students going off and looking up the answers in another tab somewhere. So you can uh, do that with lock mode quizzes. And of course, today we're going to talk a bit more about self-marking quizzes. So that's some of the things you can do with forms. Um, to get started with forms, there's there's three ways to launch forms. You can either go to the waffle up in the corner of your browser and click on the little nine dots button, the channel nine button, as my kids used to call it, <laughs> um, and, uh, and just launch it from there. Or you can go to drive, go to new, more, Google Forms will be hiding under the more button. Um, although, you know, the shortcut I like is just type in forms.new into the Omnibox in Chrome and that will launch one as well. So it doesn't matter how you do it, but that's how you launch a form. Once you launch a form, you, you I mean, it's pretty intuitive to get started. You just start typing your questions. Yeah. But there is a little box that pops up on the side and it's just worth pointing out that, you know, the thing you'll use most often is the thing at the top, the little plus sign, because that's how you create new questions. Uh, but you can also add questions from another form. And I think not enough people do this, actually. Do you, do you do that, ever do this? Where you bring... I haven't. Oh, no, I haven't used that. It's amazing. So you use that second button there, add questions from another form. So if you've got a form with some questions in it and you want to recycle those questions, click that button. It'll give you a list of all the forms in your drive. You pick the one you want, and then it'll identify all the questions in that form, and you can choose which ones you want to, to draw. Mm. Okay. So... So creating like a question bank. So I, I see like like subject departments in say a high school might have a, you know, the science department might have a, a big form with all these questions that they use in sort of you know, quizzes and exams and stuff. Mm. And teachers can come along with a new form and simply suck in the questions that they want and assemble something really quickly. Right. Uh, title blocks, you can put a standalone image in there, standalone video in there, which is great if you want to say to kids, like, look at this picture, watch this video, and then here's a bunch of questions about it. Um, and that last bit there about creating new sections, that's for dividing your form up into sections, like blocks. And that's kind of the thing you need to do if you're going to do the branching stuff. Yeah, that's the one blocks. you need to be able to jump from place to place, isn't it? Yeah, you're really jumping from section to section. So you gotcha. need to design the, the, the form around those sections. Yep. All right. So lock mode, lock mode quizzes, we kind of mentioned that. Um, works on managed Chromebooks only. Um, and also you can deploy it out through Google Classroom as well, which is neat. Um, and that's kind of what you get when you And, and also, uh, if you're using a uh, popular um, uh, generative uh, AI model, then you can uh, ask Bard to actually create those questions for you. So you can go create me 25 question and answers on geography, uh, geography of the ocean, 
Look, Cree, a hold of questions, copy paste them in. There you go. There's your, there's your form ready to go. Nice. I like that idea. Uh, we'll point out, though, that you did say copy and paste them in. So, like, we're not quite at the point yet where you can say to. Not yet. That's right. Yeah. Go to yep. Bard and say, like, just make me some questions and it will automatically generate the quiz. We're not quite there yet, but that seems like an obvious next step. Yeah, you'd hope so. I I had a feeling there was an extension for it. I'm not sure, but yeah, don't know. Interesting. Maybe, okay. Maybe. All right. Um, in terms of question types, and I'm a bit of a stickler for this. So I, I having worked with lots of teachers to create forms, I always find teachers sort of get stuck on short answer and multiple choice. And it becomes that thing about when your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So you, you just get used to using multiple choice questions and then like everything's a multiple choice question. So yeah. I just want to point out to everyone, there's actually, I think it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know, there's about, I don't know, different question types there that you can use. And each question type is ideal for collecting a certain type of data. So for example, the one there called linear scale is like on a scale of one to five or one to ten. Yeah. Like, yeah. How do you feel about it? So it's great for measuring sentiment. Uh, multiple choice is obviously good if you've got, um, you know, certain answers you want students to pick from. Um, a multiple choice question with only two options, by the way, becomes a true or false question. Um, and those multiple choice grids and checkbox grids, really effective. And you can actually do matching exercises where you're trying to mm. like match, I don't know, match the country with the capital or something because you can you can do it. As most people think about it as kind of like a drag and drop thing, which forms can't do. But if you just rethink the question a bit, you can actually do a lot of that sort of drag and drop matching stuff using the right. multiple choice on the checkbox screen. So I've got a link there on the page if anyone wants to follow it along. It's bit.ly slash what's with all the questions. And <laughs> um, if you follow that link, I've actually made a form that has examples of all the different question types and all the variations on all the different question types. So if you want to see all the different possible things you can do inside a form, uh, bit.ly slash watch with all the questions is a nice little thing you can sort of browse through and see some good examples about how that works. Now, we are going to talk about self-marking quizzes. And so I've also put this together for people as well. When you do self-marking questions, not every question type can be self-marking. Obviously, if it's a long answer question, so like an essay style thing, um, that's not self-marking, not yet anyway. Maybe one day there'll be a Gen AI in the background that can sit and read it for you and, and tell you whether it's good or not. But right now, that's not the case. Mm. Uh, so short answer, multiple choice, checkbox, drop down, multiple choice, grid, checkbox, grid. Because they are all kind of definite responses, they can be self-marked. And again, if you want to see some examples of self-marking questions, bit.ly slash self-marking questions. Uh, there's another example there you can go to, and it's going to show you examples of all the different types of questions that you could ask and all the variations on those questions um, of self-marking. So you get to see how some of that stuff works. So hopefully that's useful to you. Now, what do I click on there? Oh, I didn't mean to click on that. Self-marking quizzes. Yeah, I did. I clicked on the wrong part of the quiz. There you go. <laughs> um, the other things worth mentioning, we just said there are some questions that can't be auto-graded. Um, uh, so they have to be human graded, um, or maybe in the future AI graded, but right now maybe. human graded. Um, so there's also a little example there, bit.ly slash human graded. If you go there, there's just like a an example of like the sorts of questions you can ask if you human grade it. Now, when you human grade a question in a Google form, uh, the student answers it, types the answer in. Because it's not getting auto graded immediately, it goes into the back end of Google Forms um, and then just waits for the teacher to come in and manually grade it. And the teacher can put a grade on it um, and then and then mark it as uh, graded. And then um, it'll go back to the student when they hand that stuff back. So good to know. We talked about branching forms a minute ago and mm -hmm. this idea of um, creating a branching form. And there's a little simple exam there. I will actually show you this one because this is this just shows you how the branching stuff works. So like as an example, choose an animal, Steve. Cat or dog? Dog. Dog, I knew you'd say that. And we yeah. go next. And so it comes up here and it says, okay, which dog do you prefer? Oh, sheesh. Uh, cattle dog. Cattle dog. Okay. So you go cattle dog and then uh, and then you go next and then it'll branch to somewhere else. Hey, do you now do you now understand how this works? Please yes, say I do. No. Please say yes. no. Please say no. Uh, no, I don't. No, oh, yeah. no oh, idea. It really works, then. So we go, no. I'm and then we'll talk back to the beginning. <laughs> um, so, and you see now if I say cats, 
and I go next, it's, now it's going to give me questions about cats, uh, right? So that's an example of branching. It just goes one way or the other. So gotcha. um, that's how the branching stuff works. And there's a little diagram here just to show you kind of, I mentioned sections before. You divide your quiz up into sections. So you've got this top section, this middle section, this last section. I've labelled them cats and dogs. And then this flow chart kind of shows you how that works. So depending on... Now, the thing that branches is always a multiple choice question. And so when you when you set up the multiple choice question, one of the options in there is it's like go to a, go to a section based on the answer. Uh, and depending on what you choose there, it will branch to one of those sections. And there's a flow chart just to show you the logic of it. When, there's a really there's a really nice aspect of actually designing when you're doing that. So it's it's you look at that and you go, that's easy, but you've actually got to design them really, really well. Uh, well, you, you might see I've, I've put down the bottom in red print there. Warning: these require a lot of planning. They really they do. They really do. Yeah. Um, the dog and cat example is pretty simple, but you can imagine if you have a uh, a form that starts to branch and branch and branch and branch mm -hmm. and branch, it's really complicated really quickly. Yeah. Dare I say exponentially? And um, <laughs> yeah, and so re you really do need to plan it out on paper. So for students, uh, for, for teachers doing this with students, this is a great exercise, not so much in making a form, but in planning and getting kids to think through yeah. how th how information flows. Yeah, yeah. Yes. As part of the New Zealand curriculum, is a uh, designing a digital outcome. You know, and this is part of it. You know, so it's actually and it's it's a bit of computational thinking because it's a, if then you know if if not that then this. So it's it's a nice part of that thinking as well. Yeah. Now, in, in this example, I'm going from like one to many. So I'm going like first question says dog or cat. Then you go to the like dog or the cat. And then there's more choices. And there's more choices. So if you think about this branching, it kind of starts narrow and branches out. I want to show you a, an alternative way of doing it. I, I call this a dichotomous key. I think that's the correct term for it. And it's kind of like the opposite. You have lots of choices and you narrow down to one. Uh, right. So it's kind of the opposite. So I'll just show you the example because it's the same thing about branching but in reverse. So this is like asking what kind of vertebrate is that? So you've got all these pictures of animals. And by the way, if you want to do this in class, I've actually put a, a link to a slide deck there that you can go and you can have the slides to come up on the big screen in the classroom if you want. Um, but uh, you want to pick an animal, Steve? A uh, snake. A snake. A green okay. tree snake. Okay, boy, shall I pick this green tree snake. So I click on the tree snake and go next. Okay, so the first question it asks is, does it have fur? No. No. Not that I know of. So you go, no. And then the next question is, does it have feathers? No. No, it does not. So we'll say no. And then you go next. And does it have dry skin? Well, apparently. I think it does. Yes. yes. We go next. And there you go. Your animal is a yeah. reptile. And nice. Okay. So... That's the idea of a dichotomous key. And again, for students who are doing biology or something, like getting them to to build these things, to really think through the, the um, uh, you know, the, I don't know, just that sort of uh, structural kind of thinking. Again, takes lots of planning. Yeah. Um, whenever I design a quiz or a form or anything at all, this is my process, uh, and I think it's a good one. Um, you create the new form, you add your questions, you add your sections if you need it. Make sure you use the right question types. Can't stress that enough. I see so many people asking. I know what they want to collect, but they're just asking the wrong question type to do it. Um, so uh, then you enable the quiz mode and you set your correct answers and your feedback. Then you check your settings. I'm going to go into this and show you in just a sec. Then you test your quiz. I put that in red because, oh, man, the number of times I see people make a quiz or or, or even a form for that matter, and they, they just don't test it. Yeah. And then they get people writing back going, I can't access it. Or you've given me a choice that, I, like, it's a multiple choice things and none of them apply. Like, think it through, do it, test mm -hmm. it. And once you've tested it, then you distribute the form to all your users. You can distribute it in multiple ways, classroom, email, URL, embedded in social, whatever. And then you analyze your results and export to a sheet if needed. So that's kind of the process. It's pretty straightforward. And that, that embed bit as well, you can chuck it in the site, can't you? So you can actually embed the form into a yeah, site. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. it's active on the site. Yeah, on, either on a Google site or it's standard embed code. So you can put it on a WordPress site or you know, anything that takes embed code. Mm. Um, and the other thing I don't think a lot of people realize is you can actually print Google Forms. Like, I'm, I'm not advocating for printing, but there are times when someone might need to print something. One of the nice things about it is that if you create a form 
and you hit the print button and print it, it doesn't just print like a screen grab of that. It actually gives you a like a paper mm. suitable version of it. So where you had like a long answer type thing, it actually gives you a bunch of lines. Um, if you have a multiple choice question, it'll give you little boxes to color in and so on. So it actually does a really good job of converting it to um, to something that works on paper. Yeah. Someone was thinking when they designed that, but I know, right? So I'm going to come out of here now and just go into my drive and let's do this. So I'm going to go into uh, where September. We're going here. So I'm going to try going there. There you go. Uh, so I'm going to go to the new button and Google Forms. Oh, there you go. That's right. They moved Google Forms into the main list, didn't they? Yes, they did. They did. It used to be in the more. It did. Yeah. Um, and so, so here's the things you need to know just about. Um, Self-marking quizzes. So I'm just going to call this quiz. Uh, you want to come up with a question for me? Uh, how many days are there in a month? <laughs> no, that's too hard because there's multiple answers for that one. How I many days are there in a week? For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. What's the capital of New Zealand? Okay. Yeah, go, what yeah. is the capital of New Zealand? Right. So you do that. Um, and you're going to give me some options here, right? Yeah, Auckland, because most people choose that one. There, that's wrong. It's quite it. <laughs> Auckland. Auckland, Wellington, or Christchurch. Wellington, Christchurch. Oops, church. No, I can't type today. And uh, I better have four because it's standard. Dunedin. Fuck a Dunedin. Fuck a Dunedin. Fuck a Dunedin. Fuck a Dunedin. There you go. Right. Um, yeah, so, and and uh, did you know that you can, if, if you don't like the order of those, you can pick them up by a little grabby handle and move them around? Mm. So that's good to know. Um, yeah. Okay. So you write your question. And, and I'm not going to do this, but you can write a whole bunch more questions. This is the button I was talking about that you can click on. And these are all the, all the question types you can have. So you write your questions. You put them all in there. The, the thing I really want people to take away from this today is that to turn a form, which is right now it's a form that is acting like a survey, but this one has a correct answer, so we want to make it a quiz. So what you do is you go to the settings up here and you flip this little switch that says make this a quiz. As soon as you do that, it stops behaving like a survey and starts behaving like a quiz. Mm. Now, um, when you turn that on, it brings up a whole bunch of other settings and you can choose, like, when do you want to give the mark back to the student? Do you want to do it, like, immediately after they've finished or do you want to wait until you're ready to release it. You can, you can have your choice there. Um, what do you want to tell students about what they what their results are? Do you want to show them their missed questions? Do you want to tell them if they got something correct? Do you want to tell them what the points were? So you've got all these options as well. You can have a standard default point value. And this is what I was talking about before about the lock mode. Mm. If I wanted to distribute this to students who I know are going to use it on a Chromebook that's like a managed Chromebook, I can flip this little switch and now it will behave in locked mode when they open it. Be aware that if you launch this to students that don't have a managed Chromebook, they won't be able to interact with it at all. It'll just shut them out and say, sorry, this is not for you. So the lock mode is you can't go somewhere else while you're doing the, the form, right? You're, you're exactly. stuck on the form. Exactly right. As soon as you start the quiz, it'll go full screen. It won't allow you to switch to any other applications. And as soon as you hit the submit button at the end, then it hands everything back to you again. Gotcha. And so that's that's the setting for the quiz. And then the other thing, if you think back to my little flowchart before, the things you've got to do, check the settings. Uh, oh, sorry, check the settings. So it's uh, down here. Um, so uh, in the responses, like, do you want to collect their email address or not? So, you know, sometimes you want to do something anonymously. Sometimes you don't. You want to verify it against who they're logged in with. Maybe you just want to ask them to type in an email address. You've got all those options there. Uh, I'm not going to collect this. Um, this is the one that catches everybody out, restrict yeah. users, right? By default, this is on. And that means anyone outside your, outside your domain won't be able to fill this quiz in. Now, if it's just your students, that's fine. But if you're making a form that's going out to parents, say, that's got to be off or they won't be able to uh, fill out the form. That's the setting most people forget when they send a form out, and that's the one. This is why you test it. So yep. now turn that off. And you can also choose to limit to one response or not. Because it's a quiz, you might want them to only have one go, or you might want to be generous and allow them to do it multiple times until they get it all correct. Up to you how you do it. And there's a few other settings in there. I won't go through them all right now. But the confirmation pretty... message is one, I think, is one you should always change because it's a bit, 
Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is your response has been recorded. I always yeah. like to edit that and do something. Thanks yeah. for your time or blah, blah. Yeah. And interestingly. A legend. Yeah. You can also put a, like a YouTube link in there and they can play a little song or there's, oh, a, there's, there's all sorts of things you can put in there as well. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, that's so good. You put like a, oh. a little YouTube link to a video that says congratulations or something. Nice. So anyway, there are the settings. So just go through the settings. We don't have time to unpack them all for you right now, but there are tons of settings there. Do check them. They're pretty self-explanatory and make sure this is going to behave the way you want it to behave. Now, once you've set all that, when you come back, because we turned this into a quiz, the question that we wrote before now has a couple of things it didn't have before because that's obviously a quiz. It's got to be different. One of the things is it needs to know what the answer is. So if I click this answer key down here, this is where I get to tell it, and, and, and the answer is Wellington, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the beehive. There you go. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, so you indicate what the correct answer or answers are, right? That's not, not the case. But, but, <laughs> And, and here's the thing that I think makes this really powerful is adding answer feedback. So if a kid gets this wrong, what would you want to say to them? And if they get it right, what would you want to say to them? So I can add answer feedback here. And I can say for a correct answer, uh, you know, go you. That's, that's right. Um, and, if, and then I can uh, say incorrect answers. Uh, not quite um try again or i could i could put a link in there to a resource and point them to a web page or something where i could maybe ask them to go and sort of look for the answer or maybe i could put a youtube video in there there's links there to do both of those things um, but yeah i think the important thing is that you're giving students that feedback about whether they get it right or wrong and honestly i'm, I'm just doing this in the state in the in the interest of time, I'm being pretty brief with this, but you know, go you, that's right, it's probably not that useful, and saying not quite try again, probably not that useful. What's much more useful if you give them some resources to try and figure out why they got it wrong so that next time they do it, they can obviously... So if you're doing a, an algebra question, you might chuck an Eddie Woo video in there or something, yeah? Exactly right, exactly right. And next month, we're actually going to be talking about practice sets next month. Some of, some of the people watching this might, uh, you know, might already know a fair bit about Google and they're kind of thinking to themselves, hang on, isn't this a bit what practice sets does? And it kind of is, this is obviously before practice sets. And that's why I wanted to do this today so that next month we can talk about practice sets and we can sort of compare the differences. There are times when I'd use this and there are times when I'd use practice sets and, and people can figure out for themselves which they prefer. Um, so there you go. So that's, that's, that's what a good self-marking question looks like. It's got a question, it's got some answers. Um, obviously different question types, but it's got feedback and it's got the correct answer indicated. So once we've done all that, we say done, and that's what it looks like. Now, when, when someone does this question, right, it comes up like that, and I say, okay, well, let's get it wrong. Let's say the answer's Auckland, and I say submit. It's going to actually come up here and say you're a legend. Oh, why didn't you give me that? That's because you gave, you gave it two right answers. Oh, did I? Yeah, did I know. It's weird. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, there, there's the feedback there, yeah, not quite. Yeah, not quite dragging, yeah. So, so having that feedback in there, I think, is really, really useful, really useful. Oh, the Euro Legend was the, the that the, was the the form when you submit. It's the feedback from submission, yeah, the yeah. end, yeah. That's it, yeah. So you can see it's marked it as wrong. It's given that, and if I was to do that again, uh, I think I can do that again. I don't think I marked it as. Uh, no, you did it. You did it only one, only one go. Did I? Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can change it. No, no, I turned that off. Turn that off. Oh, you did. Oh. Yeah, I did. So if I go in there and, I, and we do that again, so you can see now if I go with the correct answer, we go Wellington and we we'll say submit. And now when I view my score, you're going to see that that's green. It tells me it's right. Go you. That's right. Yay. Yes. Right? So it's giving that feedback to the student. And obviously, if I had a link or something in here that they could follow, um, I like to, whenever I do this, I like to not only give remediating feedback to a student who got it wrong, but I actually like to give extending feedback to a student who got it right. So if they know that was the answer, maybe, you know, maybe link them to a video about other world capitals so they can learn something else. So anyway, so that is um, all we want to cover today about um, the quiz stuff. Hopefully that's useful to people. Any thoughts, Steve? No, look, I think using forms is... Is really useful for that sort of stuff. There's a, there's a lot more to forms than, as you say, than being just collecting data. And you had the idea about branching quizzes and, and 
twisted plot stories and all that sort of stuff, which again makes students think a lot more about design. And so yeah. there's, it actually brings a lot of really good thinking into this just designing a quiz thing. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, that I think it's probably a perception among some that uh, that the whole point of creating this stuff with forms is to test existing knowledge. But I actually see it more as a way of getting students to do something creative and to think through a process. It's the creation of the form that's far more important to me than actually like them just doing something to collect answers. That's, yeah. that's the low hanging fruit. Okay, so that is all the stuff we want to talk about forms. And um, just a couple of things that are new with Google for Education I want to talk about this month. Um, and you might weigh in on the duet, Steve, because I know you, you're you pretty, um, you like the duet stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. We're not oh, sure yeah. when, it's, when it's coming to education yet as the only thing, but yeah, I'll definitely have a little quick chat about that when we get there, for sure. Well, it is available to Gmail users right now. If it is. If they go into labs, they can enable it through Gmail. So I thought I'd throw it in there. So true. Yeah, yeah. And just see. So those are the things I thought we'd just talk about, uh, just a couple of things this month. So first thing is um, locking files more easily in Google Drive. So this is a new option in Google Drive, and I can probably just escape out of here, go into my Google Drive, and let's see if I can do it to this one. So if I do that and go to file information, you can see I've got an option here to lock. So... I mean, you could always, if you have a file that's shared with other people uh, and you don't want them to make any more changes, you can always go and like unshare it to everybody. But it's much quicker now because you can just come in here and just lock it. Mm. And it just means that nobody can make any change to that file. Um, so that's, that's it's a small thing, but it's a good thing. And I think really relevant for education because sometimes, you know, if a student, you know, if you give something to a student or a student hands something in and you don't want it to be changed anymore, like you can just lock it so it can't mm -hmm. change. Um, I know that's been a big bugbear for people for a while. That kids come in after the after the event and and change their work. Yeah. So uh, so it's good also for like planning documents or policy documents as well. You know, we have a, a, a oh, policy yeah, yeah. or a rules document. Lock it. No one can change it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so that's that's a nice easy one, and that's available in all editions of Workspace. Uh, and then there's this one, which is a nice new little one here, to view the speaker notes while co-presenting. Uh, and people might remember that we introduced a thing a while back where you can see your speaker notes while you're in Google Meet. So if you're giving a presentation and you want your speaker notes on the screen, you can turn them on just simply by clicking the little uh, this little button, I'm sorry, this little button right here. Um, but now that works with co-presenters as well. So you can now have someone else co-presenting on a slide deck with you uh, and they can also see the notes. But the, the, people, thing, the people watching the meet can't see them. That's the thing I thought. It, well, that's no, not, no, everyone that's, can yeah. see it, but no, only you yeah. can see them. So it's only a nice little, nice little feature, but quite a complicated little feature. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think we mentioned this last month, but it wasn't actually enabled at the time and it is now. Um, if I click on there, you see you've got this turn on the pen. We talked about it last time, but it wasn't available. Or Shift L if you're a keyboard shortcut person. So if I go Shift L, you can see now I actually have a pen and I can sort of draw on the screen. Um, and that, if I if I go to the next slide, and then I come back, it's still there. So it stays persistent. But if I quit the slide deck, and then start the slide deck again, it goes away. Mm. So it's persistent while the deck is still running. But if you exit out and start it again, you, you lose the annotations. So it's not a permanent yeah. annotation thing. Just mm. people should be aware right. of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that is available. This um, this co-presenting thing, by the way, is available to teaching and learning and plus. All right. Um, this uh, there's three things that have come to Workspace, has not come to Workspace for Education just yet. But if you go to labs.google.com. And you can go in there and you can turn it on for your Gmail account. So if anyone's watching this and they want to have a play with these AI, Gen AI, BARD features inside Workspace, uh, you can do that, labs.google.com. Find the find the sort of Workspace features in there. There's a few labs you can play with, but find the Workspace one, turn it on. Uh, it generally becomes available to you instantly, even though it says join the wait list. Um, it generally gets turned on pretty much immediately. Uh, and you'll get access to these three features we're about to show you. So the first one is having BARD inside Workspace. So when you load this up, um, and I can't show you on this because I'm not in an account that has this enabled right now, unless you wanted to, Mr. Mr. Smith. I, I 
I've got that on my personal Gmail, um, and I don't think I've got my personal Gmail on this device. Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the same um, thing. So yeah, think, so that's popped up in my personal Gmail and also my personal docs as well. Yeah. So I'm not going to demonstrate it because people can go and have a play with it, but basically it puts a barred prompt on Google Docs. Mm. And so, in, you know, you, you want to write a, you know, a report or an essay or a whatever, you can just into the, into the little box in there where it says help me write, click on that, tell it what you need, and Bard will actually write something for you. Obviously, this has many implications for education. <laughs> sure does. Um, there's been no official word on uh, when this is going to come to the education version of Workspace, but I can tell you two things fairly certainly. It's probably not going to be available to students under 18, and, it's, and, it, and it will be an additional feature on top of Workspace. So it, it'll be something that if you want, it's, it's an extra paid feature. Um, no idea of pricing or anything right now, um, but uh, just be aware of that. It won't just magically appear in your service. No, that, that was a, that was a question from a couple of people: was how do I how do I if I don't want this, how do I stop it popping up? It's like it's not going to pop up. You would need to turn it on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then there will be a cost for it. We don't know how much, but um, this is super expensive stuff to uh, to do from from the from the provider's end mm -hmm. uh, generative ai stuff is very computationally intensive uh, but there you go so that's that's uh that's that that's in google docs and in gmail i do like the fact that in gmail particularly i can go into my gmail and i can just give it a couple of bullet points for the email i want to write and then just hit the button that says like write and it'll take my bullet points and turn it into a fully fledged email yeah it's great it makes it sound very intelligent it does uh, so that's the first thing. Then there is um, this new feature in Google Slides uh, as part of this Duet AI. Uh, and you can, um, where you would normally insert an image, you've now got the ability, to, it's called Help Me Visualize. And you describe what you want and it will generate images for you. So it uses, I guess, um, some sort of diffusion model to create these images. Um, so if you describe what you want, you can see in the example there, a small garden in a glass bowl with flowers, grass, mushrooms in pastel colours, hit the create button, the thing will generate a bunch of images and then you just click on the one you want and it pops it into your slide deck for you. There is a drop it is, it is It is generative as well, so it's not doing a Google search, it is generative AI, so yeah, it's a brand new image. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, you'll notice in that drop down box where they just chose the word photography, there's a whole bunch of other choices in there as well. So you can have like, you know, um, like watercolor or cartoon or whatever. And the one I like there is that there's actually an option in that drop down box for background. If you mm. set it to background before you hit the generate button, it'll actually generate something and put it in the background of the entire slide. Um, and that, I think, it actually makes some quite beautiful things. I think there's also a pic, is there a pixel art as well? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then finally, the last thing is uh, with all this um, smart duet AI stuff, uh, as well as writing stuff from scratch, it, it also has now a, a feature called proofread, which can proofread the stuff that you write and actually mm. tell you things like, you know, it'll, it'll uh, brief you for conciseness, active voice, wording, split sentences, and obviously it does all spelling and grammar as well. But it's just like a uh, like a grammar check, spell check on steroids. It, it has a whole bunch of additional features to try and help you write better. Um, and that, again, AI powered stuff, but it's it's looking at your writing to improve it rather than trying to generate stuff from scratch all the time. Yeah. So yeah, it reads it for you and then gives you some feedback based on what you've written. It's, it's really nice. Yeah. Um, as always, we will make this slide deck available after this and we'll stick it up on the website. So you've got a link to these slides if you want to go through there for any of the links that we've talked about today. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's it. Uh, that, we'll keep it short this week. We're actually finished ahead of time. Um, next month, we, work, we will talk about practice sets. And you'll, if you come to next month, you'll see there's probably a fair bit of overlap between the ideas of self-marking quizzes and the ideas of practice sets, but it's a different implementation about how that's done. Um, practice sets lives right inside classroom. Uh, and I, I think from what I've heard, I don't know if you've heard it too, Steve, there's a lot of teachers who have built things in, in forms over the years and they're saying, can I just import them into practice sets? That'd be cool. Mm. I know that's a piece of feedback the team has heard. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think probably 
I don't know. I said that might be something that might eventually happen, perhaps. Like, who knows? Who knows? Uh, anyway, so so practice that next month, and then we'll round off the year in November with um, just talking about digital portfolios uh, and how we showcase student work. Uh, and we'll no doubt be talking about probably uh, Google Sites when we talk about that. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to tell your friends about these, uh, there is a link right there. There's a register there link. Again, we'll give you the slides and you've got that link. Um, but yeah, please tell your friends. We've got quite a few people on the list now that get the replays of this. Indeed. Um, and and as always, I take the recording from these sessions. I upload it to YouTube and stick it into this playlist. Uh, and the link is right there. So you, know, you can go back and revisit anything we've done uh, over really over the last couple of years. So it's becoming quite a list now. Mm. Finally, if anyone wants a certificate for having attended, uh, it's bit.ly slash GFE certificate, and you can just fill that form in. It's an honor system, and it will download to you. And that, my friends, is the end of this session. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris, again. Um, nice work, Ben. It's, uh, uh, people are always amazed how much more there is to forms than just collecting responses for a, a night of takeaways or, or what you want for dinner. Yeah, it's really true. It's it's. Uh, I think I think we make a lot of really intuitive tools that are easy to use, and the double-edged sword of that is sometimes people don't dig deeper because it's they're so easy, easy to use on the surface. But if you actually start to dig down into below some of our tools, they're incredibly sophisticated. Um, yep. but they look decept deceptively simple. All right. Well, with that note, um, thank you, Steve, and I will. See you guys later. See you folks, Kaki Day.